I'm Pam Marenko, the CEO and founder of Proficient Learning. Today, we'll be talking about the new sales engagement model and what matters now. The question to us as leaders is not really should we change, but how do we change? We know our customers are expecting a new sales engagement model. So now we need to determine how the mindset, skills, and behaviors of our sales teams need to stretch to meet this transformation. We as trainers have a seat at the table right now. We are being asked for our opinions and thoughts on how we spearhead this change that needs to happen with our sales organizations. We know that our customers are expecting change. They're expecting our engagement process to be different. They're expecting our go-to-market strategy to be different. And as training leaders, we need to lead the way in what those things need to be, how we need to stretch the skill sets of our existing sales teams, how we may need to transform the model entirely in how we go to market and how we contact our key customers. This, this whole notion of customers are expecting a new engagement model from us, I don't think is a new thing. And what I mean by that is that's been happening for a long while and the signals are there, particularly if we look at the ever decreasing access. And so they're speaking, they're speaking with their doors. They're speaking with the closure of their doors or the closure of their meetings to say how you're currently engaging with me is not how I want you to or how I need you to. So you're wasting my time. I don't see value from that of me investing my time, which is extremely valuable to them. So I'm only, I'm going to be very selective with who I choose to engage with. And I think all that COVID has done is just accelerate and force the hand of the industry to shift. And so we know that there's been a lot of denial out there because people have been rusted onto comfort zones that of things that let's not be, let's not kid ourselves. They have, they have worked to a certain extent, but they're ever decreasing in their impact and their effectiveness. And so what I, what I see has happened is COVID has just accelerated maybe four or five years of digital engagement um, together with an, this understanding that we have to think about the 360 degree, degree view of how a customer seeks and sources information and then the decisions they make relative to that um, and, and evolve in, in line with that. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think that, COVID has done anything else other than that. We know that our market is shifting and that our customers are expecting a new engagement model as we interact with them. Moving forward, customers want us to use either an all virtual or a mix of virtual and in-person approach. Research shows us that this mixed approach will also increase sales growth, which will continue our shift away from a field first mentality. As the account manager model is evolving, we'll see inside sales rescale for efficiency and key account management teams rescale for effectiveness. This means traditional field teams will reduce and reinvent with virtual selling. With these changes, we as leaders will need to create new ways to encourage meaningful connections. The farmer rep, the traditional farmer rep who has relied on relationship building uh, is going to struggle in this, in this new world moving forward. And I say that because they need to understand their customer at a different level and all of the influences that sit around that customer and, and really understand that the ability for a physician to make an isolated decision is decreasing at a rate of knots and that that's sometimes been taken away from them. But in a big way, the, the, that direct pharmaceutical influence is, is diminishing significantly because of all those other channels. And so I think that's the piece where companies are possibly struggling with now when they're looking at a, a group of representatives who have traditionally uh, like you said, being the forefront, uh, being the being the keystone for the relationship at a company level, um, but is that based on just relationship? And how what's the what's the depth of that that relationship at a company level beyond just I really like you and we're good friends? Um, because that's not going to cut it anymore.
particularly now. What are the two, three, or four things that I can say that we need to do or actions we need to take or strategic concepts we need to embrace or, you know, what are the things I can say? And it sounds ridiculous, but what are the things I can say at that table that give me credibility that are meaningful? Uh, this is the key, the big question. And we, we talk about the extent of experience that, that proficient learning has in that space of key account management cross-functional key account management. And I think it's, it's taking that and elevating it to the next level. The next piece is around the behaviours. And I think first and foremost, it's about team. And so that notion of one person owns the customer is that creates a poorer customer experience. They might think not. They might think that because I, I'm the best friend, I've got the best relationship with this clinician, that, that is, um, that's the best we can achieve but that's, that's a limited viewpoint of what's possible. And we know that. We know, the data's there already. I mean, the, the company like Trilations has that data, that a single source of, of engagement achieves a ceiling effect in terms of performance. If you have a multi-channel approach, you, you, you have a magnitude of improvement. But if you have a true harmonized, personalized engagement using that omni-channel framework, then you achieve a, a significant magnitude of market share performance. And so that's, and that's very, very consistent. And so whilst in an isolated case, that customer rep relationship might be brilliant, it's, that's not going to make you successful because it's one in a group of many, many physicians. And so it's how do we make sure that that mix across that, that segment group is appropriate and relative to their preferences and the impact that we now understand will shift the needle on performance. Um, and then the people. And so that's like we talked about before, it's about evolving that the mindsets and behavior of the the reps, so it's not a it's not a, a metric based coverage and frequency focus that they have, which tends to breed ticking the box mm. and a much more intuitive. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about critical thinking, strategic business acumen, uh, a, a dynamic team uh, coming together and, and understanding that we are all together. And whilst there whilst there might be one individual who is in the front of coordinating that and orchestrating that. It's understanding that if I if I leverage all of these competencies and the capabilities across the uh, um, the uh, the customer engagement matrix, then I am a rep. I'm a, I'm as a rep. Sorry, I am a, as a rep. I'll start again. As a rep, I'm going to be much more successful than I would have been if I just go it alone. And I've got my kit back and kit bag and three key selling messages. It's going to get me some way of the of the uh, output that I want, but it's, it's only going to get me here and I want to go three or four steps further. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a key account manager, if you're a rep right now, you have to shift your mindset away from inside sales through a, through a medium such as this is something that head office does to based on how my customer wants to engage with me on at any given time could shift. In one moment, I might be calling them as I've done for the last 10 years. I've always called them. I could be texting them. If I'm lucky enough, I've got a face-to-face -face interaction and that's brilliant, but we know that that is lessening certainly at the moment, and that, but that will come back to some level. Or if the customer wants to see me through this medium because it's easier for them, then, hey, that's brilliant. Let's embrace it. And so it's just another way of me as a, as a, of a, of a, as a customer engagement individual of interacting with my customer relative to where they are right now. Uh, and not, not thinking of this as inside sales or a head office medium. It just, you know, I call them, I email them, I, I Zoom them, uh, or I text them. Or I, I, if I'm lucky enough, I've got an appointment and we catch up and that's fantastic. The smart ones will see how this will increase. This will increase their access tenfold. And I'm just pulling a number out of the sky there. But mm. if, I, if, I'm, if I don't have to get in my car, get on the train, drive across town, find a car park, pay for parking, walk through the hospital. If I can just log on in this manner and do this, you know, five or six times a day, as well as the customers who have seen me face to face, then my access increases, you know, in a significant way. So.
At some point you mentioned being a disease management consultant and some of the things I hear you saying are talking about needing to have that depth of understanding comprehensively across the patient journey. And we've talked with a number of, of customers very recently, I mean, even including today, where historically their companies and their, their initiatives have been very patient centric. And they've, they've talked a lot about patient centricity, you know, everything is about the patient. And now as we're shifting or talking more about the being customer centric or, you know, making sure that we are understanding that the HCP is our customer, whoever the, the system or individual is. So how does that customer centricity overlap or relate to the patient centricity that's, that's underneath that really is, you know, pulling this other piece down, but how do we reconcile those two that are seemingly different? The disease ma management consultant piece for me is about training, training people who engage with customers well beyond your product features and benefits. So traditionally what we've done is train up teams in that with a little bit of disease background and then sent them out there. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is a disease management consultant is not trying to create a pseudo MSL. It's making sure that the people who are engaged with representing your company can be as professional as they possibly can. And I reference you know, any other market that you think of where they understand the entire matrix that the customer is thinking about when they're making a prescribing decision. And the disease management consulting piece is understanding, yes, your product and your features and benefits, but all of the other products that sit in that, in that sphere, um, as well as how is a patient identified preliminary, receives a preliminary diagnosis, mobilized to a, to a treatment center if they need to be, receive a full final diagnosis at a comprehensive and incorrect manner, implementation of therapy, and then management thereafter, after they leave the, the, the clinician's office. Um, because all of those elements will come together to put yourself in a position where you can aspire to become a trusted advisor with this clinician. Because they're, you know, they have to be across so much stuff that it's impossible for them to be a, across the breadth of that for every single drug and every single therapeutic area. And so that's the, that's the sweet spot or the opportunity for a, for a rep or a CAM or an MSL is to help help be that person or be that source of information. It's like a layering effect of the patient journey from beginning to end and then overlaid with the customer journey, overlaid with you know, stakeholders and influencers and how does all of that mesh and come together? And, and when we ask the question, are you approaching it like that? Are you thinking about it like that? And the answer was, we are so in our infancy with all of this that yes, that'd be great to think about all those things, but we haven't yeah. yet. That's the, I mean, companies are well, I mean, most companies I talk to have a pretty good understanding of the patient journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they understand that primarily because they've used that to build their forecasting. Uh, so they understand the funnel in terms of, you know, yeah. population, population at risk, you know, and then the other elements that move into that. For me, this, the, way, the simple way I look at that is, okay, so what is a, what is a physician doing? At each, what are they doing and thinking at each of those points? And the terminology that I think that is used in a few companies that I've engaged with is things like moments that matter. So each, each of those points is a moment that matters or a trigger point for a physician to either change or seek further, change his behaviour or her behaviour or... I don't currently have a full understanding of what should happen here in terms of best practice. So I need to seek further information from either colleagues, third party uh, institutions uh, or industry. And so that's each one of those moments, those trigger points, that's how I look at a customer journey. And so whether it be really upstream in terms of initial identification and diagnosis, or it's at the point of, I need to implement therapy or I need to change the current therapy. What capabilities and competencies are you helping your customer with at those points beyond just a pill? You know, and that's, that's patient centricity because you're, you're obviously helping in terms of that, that journey. 
and then it's look, putting in another layer at the moment, at the bottom, saying, okay, so at each of these points, what opportunities do we have relative to our competencies, our capabilities, and our resource allocation to help or build value at those points? The next layer is, okay, so if we've got an opportunity to help provide value, support, who across our marketing, market access, medical and commercial or sales teams, who is both best placed, best equipped to do that? And that's one thing is about compliance and that needs to be the first and foremost question in terms of is it, on, is it off label or on label? Uh, is it within uh, you know, the realms of our current compliance uh, rules or not? Once that's, that's decided, it's then saying, okay, so who's best place to do it? Who's got the best relationship that we can leverage? Not just who's got the relationship, but the best relationship. And then overlaying this next level of sophistication, which is about understanding preferences around content, cadence, and channel, and what we know is going to shift the needle on performance. So does that, does that make sense? If you look at yeah. that level, if you look at those levels, and then you, you end up at the bottom and saying, okay, so now we've got a pretty good understanding. We're patient-centric. We, we know what the customer is thinking and doing or what they could be doing at those points. We know what the, the channel mix optimization looks like. Uh, we have the resources available in our channel mix relative to the preferences and away we go. Yeah. And then becomes that's the orchestration and the harmonized message. I think you're exactly right. If, if there are two people that go in day after day to the same clinician, very sim you know, confusing messages or similar messages, doesn't matter, but yeah. that will decrease access. So they will be less likely to see one or both the next time around. So I wonder, I mean, it, it would, it stands to reason that if we are more coordinated in our effort and more harmonized in what we're doing to interact with the, with the clinician, each interaction, we'd have a much higher likelihood of getting access if we were coordinated versus uncoordinated, repetitive, or even contradictory. Absolutely, and whilst I can't point to specific research that says that, I can, I can point to outcomes in terms of performance at, at a patient share or a market share level that definitively say that. So mm -hmm. if you take a harmonized and personalized approach, that approach that it definitively improves performance. And so if working back from there, you can quite reasonably um, connect the dots to say, well, that tells me that we're delivering value based on a customer's definition of value, not ours. I think working back from that to your point before, it's, it's, it's iterative. It's, it's, you have to think about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and looking at what, what we have now who in our team can make this transition, who has the aspiration to take that, that critical or employ that critical thinking, strategic business acumen type mindset from an outside in, challenge all of the assumptions that we have about what's worked in the past, challenge the assumptions about what's working now, particularly relevant to our, or relative to our competitive space. Um, listen to the market, look at the ecosystem and then execute relative to that have a really nice loop of feedback in a dynamic fashion that can shift in an agile manner uh, and stay ahead of the curve. I'd... Yeah, and I think aspirationally, that's, I mean, that's the aspiration, that's the hope is that we can get to that point. And I think where, where I'm hearing a lot of people are right now is at the beginning of that journey and to have such a significant paradigm shift from where they've been to what they think they need to do I think you used an expression about people needing to be brave or companies yeah. needing to be brave yeah. in doing things in a radically different way, particularly now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the companies that are prepared to be brave and let go of those rusted on go-to-market models that have worked in the past are the ones that will be successful in the future. Uh, and the ones that are stuck in their, uh, in their comfort zones at both a company level and an individual level, there's going to be much, much less of those because the, the I mean, healthcare practitioners are tired of that. They're tired. They, they you know, it, it's, things have shifted so much at a society level, uh, and the way that we absorb and engage with information has shifted so much that to think that healthcare practitioners are different to the rest of us is just crazy.
I mean, look, as an industry, we, we love our comfort zone. We're stuck on it. And we have these things called limiting beliefs. And that's particularly at a leadership level, but it's also at a rep level. And that's these, when you hear this time and time again of these reps saying, that won't work. I know my customer best. They don't want that. Um, you know, they only want a sales engagement. They want one single source of contact. It's not necessarily the truth. What they want is a coordinated and a harmonized source of contact. Who that actually delivers is based, yes, on relationship, but it's also based on who's best equipped through experience and expertise to deliver. Um, and that might be a website, it might be an app, it might be a webinar, it might be peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, it might be an MSL or a medical advisor, or it could be a key account manager, depending on their role. And so that's, it's important for the, for the individuals to think about that and, and maybe shift their thinking a little bit around uh, and, you know, how, what's worked in the past and what could work in the future. But more importantly, it's what is leadership doing? What are they thinking and what signals are they sending to their teams about how we need to engage in the future? So yeah, and then it's about, okay, so looking, if we, if we know where we are and we, we think we've got a pretty good idea of where we'd like to be, then it's at an individual company level, level looking at your cross-functional teams across market access, marketing, uh, sales and, and medical. What is the what are the processes and, and the people capabilities that we currently have relative to where we would like them to be? And that, that's a really important conversation. And then this is, and this is a conversation I'm having with a few clients at the moment is about teasing that out to say, okay, we're here, we wanna be there. Traditional gap assessment. As we're considering the new engagement model, we do need to consider what we've been doing now and then what we need to add to that equation. So to shift to the new model, we will need to stretch to meet those new complex needs. How does this new sales engagement process or model, what does it look like? And how is it different from what we're doing today? We're focusing on the core skills that we've been training account managers on for years, which is account planning, customer analysis, analytics, critical thinking, a lot of different areas that are strategic or more business-like in nature and reinforce and solidify those skills and also introduce some of the new skills that are critical and required right now as things are changing so frequently is how to coordinate and collaborate with a matrix team to deliver a, a harmonized message to our customer. As we evolve into this new customer engagement model, there are four development pillars that are calls to action for each of us as leaders to champion and to ensure that they are pulled through our organization in multiple channels. So the first is the new sales engagement model, which is engaging with customers where, when, and how they want delivering value with every interaction. In other words, meeting them where they are. The second piece is empowering your people, which is a little bit of a stretch for us, displaying the skills that are necessary to think at a higher level and, and more critical thinking, including strategic decision-making, professional presence, critical thinking, and problem solving. The third pillar is stakeholder mapping and engagement. So this is similar to what we've been doing in the past, but adding a data-driven strategy that's relevant and aligned with individualized product adoption and loyalty down to the clinician level. And the fourth and last pillar is influence and impact, to be proficient in digital strategies to influence those key stakeholders, decision makers, and influencers to deliver a long-term impact. For 15 years, Proficient Learning has been a research-driven learning and development partner. We've been thought leaders uniquely qualified to help our customers navigate and adjust to a changing landscape. We have done our research. We know where the market is headed, and we are uniquely qualified to meet those challenges head on. 